Okay, so now let's get back to the topic of the session. So Andrew introduced the topic of regulation already yesterday in his talk, but now it's really time to dive into it. I'm Caroline Schill and I will moderate uh, this conversation. I'm a researcher at the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics and the Stockholm Resilience Center. And my work is all about the complexities of human behavior and sustainability. And I'm very happy to be part of this workshop to learn from you and, and with you and also really use this workshop to dive deep into the role of AI and emotions when thinking about the well-being of people and, and our planet. So for this session, I am very happy to have with me three leading experts and deep thinkers when it comes to regulation of AI technology. And I will be sharing with you now the plan of this session and who we have with us. So I will keep the introductions of our panelists fairly short um, because we only have 30 minutes for this session, but I leave it up to our speakers if they would like to expand a little bit on who they are or what they do. Um, so first we have Jennifer Bart. Uh, Jennifer is a professor at the College of Law at the University of Cincinnati in the US. And she has written extensively about this topic. And she will provide us with an introduction to the topic from her perspective, which also includes an overview of how discussions about regulation of AI differ um, within the EU and the US. And then this introduction is followed by prepared reflections from Irina Bras and Miguel Centino. Irina is an associate professor in regulation, innovation and public, public policy at the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy at UCL in London, UK. And Irina will present briefly the risk-based approach. So also something that Andrew talked about yesterday um, and that is put forward in the proposed EU AI Act. And she will also present then where emotion technology sit vis-a-vis -vis this regulatory uh, proposal. Uh, Miguel is a professor of sociology and executive vice dean of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University in the US. And Miguel is going to speak about the difficulty of regulating social media. So after the reflections, I will give back the word to Jennifer in case you would like to respond to some reflections or questions that are posed by Irina and Miguel. And then the idea is to have a conversation. Um, but given the short session we have, I would really like this conversation to be mostly based on questions from all of us. So, so please post your questions throughout the session in the chat. Thanks a lot. And now the floor is yours, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Victor for inviting me. This has just been a wonderful two days. I've learned so much from everyone. Um, and I'm excited to, uh, to, to answer questions and also to hear what my co-panelists are talking about. So um, just because, uh, you know, I don't expect anyone to know where Cincinnati is. So here we are, the top uh, upper third of the, uh, of the country. Um, and uh, I am a professor actually at the law school and the medical school. I've been very lucky throughout my uh, academic career to go back and forth between law um, and medicine. And that's how I got interested in this topic. Uh, the, one of my core topics of research is this whole idea of getting uh, consent to participate in human subject research. Um, in the United States, we came late to research regulation law. Um, and it was really only until essentially uh, news leaked uh, in, the, in uh, the Washington newspaper about the experiment that the United States government had been conducting in um, Alabama with uh, poor remote uh, black sharecroppers who had syphilis. And they had been watching these men uh, have syphilis progress from the 1920s through when it broke in the newspapers in, 1970, in the 1970s, um, you know, long after the discovery of penicillin when one shot would have cured these men. So it was uh, horrific, unjustifiable, 
and it kickstarted um, Congress to pass laws to regulate human subject research that um, is funded by the United States government or is part of a, of a clinical trial for a drug or a vaccine that would have to be regulated. So it's not comprehensive, but it is for government funded. This is a picture of President Clinton apologizing to one of the uh, last living survivors of the, uh, of the study. So the core of uh, the regulation we have for human subject research, very similar to the Nuremberg uh, Code or the Declaration of Helsinki that you may be more familiar with, is the informed consent of each individual. So uh, the question always has been, well, what is that? What is, you know, what, what is involved in informed consent? And the structure that this, that our laws have is an individual conversation. So it is the obligation of the researcher to themselves or somebody they you know, delegate to, to communicate directly with the potential participant and give the participant the information they need to make a decision about whether to participate or not. So it's always been a question of, uh, you know, what about how does that conversation go? How are you shading it? So I had been doing a lot of looking, following technologies very carefully. Uh, you may have heard uh, the last sort of big technology uh, movement before emotion AI when it came to reading emotions and uh, knowing what people were thinking where, was uh, brain scanning that was supposedly could scan somebody's brain waves and you could tell what they were thinking. Um, and the theory was that you could use that information to influence whether um, if you were giving them a sales pitch, for example, how they were responding to it. So emotion AI is really sort of the next level of that, right? It's not scanning someone's brain waves, but the idea is, and a lot of this is what Andrew was explaining, is it's scanning their physiology, their physical reactions, face, heartbeat. It's, it's not, you know, we think of it more as facial recognition, but it really could be any biological reaction. So the question is, what would it mean if you use this as a method of influencing people to agree to be in a research subject? So what I'm going to talk about is assuming you could do that, and uh, certainly the people marketing this technology for um, to, to market products um, are claiming that you can. You can get people to buy one soap or another. So the question is, what are you doing with it? Are you developing a script tailored to the individual? Um, is this a, a black box algorithm that's designed to persuade? Um, is it whispering in the ear of the, of the researcher trying to get consent? You know, one of the challenges of regulation in this whole field is what exactly is going on? Um, so the question is, is this such a powerful tool that it should be banned? I mean, when we talk about regulation, it's a continuum. So are we talking about banning? Are we talking about limiting its use? Or are we talking about um, more in detail regulating an algorithm? For example, should there be a fail safe programmed in so that if somebody is indicating that they are uncomfortable or are disinclined to agree that it won't ramp up uh, the persuasion. So, um, you know, you may have seen this play or read it uh, in high school. Uh, Cyrano is giving advice. There's nothing new about getting advice on effective communication. And that is the pushback for regulation. How is this different than um, coaching? How is this different than um, Amazon showing some, you something you'd like to buy? Um, you know, what, where does, where is the line in persuasion? Um, and the other thing that I'm just going to raise, and we can all talk about this is, you know, is the answer disclosure? We have a lot of research in, uh, in medical consent that disclosure telling somebody that, uh, that a doctor or maybe biased doesn't change their behavior. So I, I just would put out there that uh, disclosure is frequently mentioned. It's a, uh, it's not clear how effective that is. So really, um, you know, is this something that uh, should be used in research? So I just thought I'd say a few quick things about US law, um, very baffling to our law students. So I, I know, and I know when I've spoken about this abroad, even more so, 
you can understand U.S. law better if you understand it as 13 colonies who had always operated individually found themselves uh, trying to become a country. So this is the image they often use that, you know, that they needed to join or die, that if the colonies couldn't get together and form a government, uh, the country couldn't survive. So they set up this incredibly complicated power sharing scheme where uh, the federal government, they did not want another king, still had the powers you need to run a country. So you didn't have individual states coining money and making treaties. Individual states, though, were given tremendous power over what went on in their borders. And then we have cities. And cities are a completely uh, uh, the most patchwork and diverse set of laws you can imagine, because the Constitution says nothing about cities. Every individual state is free to set up the independence or lack of independence of its cities as it wishes. So what we see in AI is a lot of cities passing um, uh, legislation, even though there's almost no state legislation and certainly no federal legislation. So I just, you know, building on what Hannah was talking about, obviously disinformation is, um, you know, sending our country just into a free fall crisis with COVID. People won't get vaccinated. The disease is spreading. Where I am, we're under a red emergency. We, we don't have the capacity in our fire department to serve the city. So things are, are tough. Um, so, you know, disinformation is, uh, is rampant. Um, this is the state of privacy law in the U.S. So if you see these, uh, it's not so much that you could read this, although I have links to everything, but it'll give you an idea of every state looks at issues of data privacy, AI, emotion AI on its own, and there's tremendous uh, variation. So just to give you an idea, um, there, the three states, um, four states have banned facial recognition. I would say that is the use of AI that is most best known and most uh, most subject to uh, legislation, which is uh, using facial recognition by law enforcement with the concern that it is racially biased and is con constantly um, targeting individuals based on misrecognition. So uh, a number of large cities have stepped up, large and small, Berkeley, San Francisco, Cambridge, um, you know, cities that you may have heard of, New Orleans, to simply ban it. So that's it. We, we cannot use facial recognition AI for law enforcement. Um, one thing that is really very new is, and it's, it's singular, no one else is doing this, is New York City has passed legislation to prohibit the use of AI in employment decisions. So um, estimates vary, but there, there are estimates that millions of job uh, interviews are augmented by, uh, by algorithms that are uh, you know, purportedly evaluating candidates for all sorts of characteristics that their employers may want. New York City has stepped in and said, First of all, you have to disclose if you're using it. And second of all, the employer has the obligation of auditing the algorithm for results that are biased or violations of discrimination law. Um, it's limited, it only applies to New York residents. So I know that was a fast run through um, US law and AI, but I hope it gives a framework for, uh, for my colleagues and, and things to ask questions about. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jennifer. This was a great introduction. And now I give the word to Irina for her reflections. Yes, thank you so, so very much, uh, Caroline. And also thanks so much for uh, Jennifer's uh, uh, talk and introduction to the challenges of how do we regulate these very, very challenging issues. Um, when it comes to how do we deal with AI and how do we deal with AI, especially within the uh, kind of remit of, of this particular conference, which is how um, artificial intelligence, uh, algorithmic systems interact with the way that we actually interact with the environment. 
the one thing that I would say before we go into the regulatory frameworks is we have to go back to the basics. And the basics for me is artificial intelligence tools, algorithms are ultimately general purpose technologies. And what I mean by that is that they are used for a number of purposes, whether they are for good or bad, intentionally so or not. So coming from this, it's critical, um, not just generally for our understanding, but also in the way that we take and we uh, uh, understand the regulatory frameworks uh, that are developing from, uh, that are trying to uh, tackle issues pertaining to uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools. So it's absolutely critical to understand that AI tools ultimately are general purpose technologies. We can use them for whatever you want to. And this is fundamental for regulatory purposes in the sense that in the uh, EU, and Caroline mentioned that I will be focusing, I'll be giving a bit of an introduction on the EU framework. I don't want to go into the depths of it. There are so many dimensions of it. But what I would say is that the proposed EU AI uh, Act uh, adopts a risk-based risk approach to the regulation, which means that ultimately um, they are proposing a categorization of the risk that is associated with AI tools on four categories, unacceptable, high, limited, and minimal. And this was uh, absolutely mentioned and it was, uh, as it was, uh, uh, as he was uh, said before by Professor Andrew McStay uh, in, uh, in, the, in the introductory panel. Now, there are a lot, while there is a lot of kind of good stuff uh, when, when it comes to the fact that, yes, we have a regulatory proposal out there that is trying to really navigate the space. At the same time, there are some limitations when it comes to it. And what, what I would like to focus on is a critique of this particular approach, bearing in mind that this risk-based approach has a lot of benefits as well. So for instance, let's think about the risk that is associated with it. Where do we identify and position this risk? Do we identify this risk at the data collection point? Do I identify it at the input? when it comes to the AI tool? Do I identify it when it comes to how that algorithm learns? Do we importantly identify it when it comes to the context, which is what Andrew mentioned at the start, or very importantly, when it comes to the outcome of that decision? So while as someone that has studied regulatory frameworks for quite a while, who teaches and is very passionate about risk uh, regulatory frameworks, risk assessment and governance, I can see the benefit of a risk-based approach to dealing with AI uh, tools, especially when it comes to emotion AI as well. And it's very nice to see it in that particular uh, regulation in the EU AI relation. At the same time, in my view, we have to think more critically about the context in which it happens and the outcomes. Because if we think that ultimately AI tools are general purpose, so they can be used for any sort of purpose, then it's very difficult to be able to map risk. So as much as we would like to structure risk in the way that this regulatory proposal is doing, ultimately in practice, whenever we talk about risk, we also talk about a lot of scientific uncertainty and also a lot of contestation. And we see it happen very often when you talk about innovation critical innovation. 
So there are some dimensions here in this particular realm that I don't think that this particular regulation is necessarily capturing when it comes to classifying risk more based on input, on context, on output. So this is my own critique of the current regulation. This is not to say that I don't think that this is a good proposal. It's good that we have it out there, but there are some challenges when it comes to it. And we can see this, especially in the space that we are talking about, when we talk about very complex emotional uh, interactions with our environment, with uh, uh, contextually with our environment, with our planet, to be able to really classify that risk in a way that the, uh, the, the, the legislation is proposing, the, uh, the, the regulation is proposing. And, and, and by the way, yes, this is very much, we are familiar, those who study risk are familiar with the uncertainties associated with it. And just before I conclude, I just want to mention two things. One is that Professor Andrew uh, McSay uh, said in, in his introductory um, uh, uh, talk that the EU AI regulation is very much as the GDPR. In scope, yes, but not in practice. If we look at the detail of it, the GDPR is very much rights-based. We are talking about the right to be informed, the right to reactification, the right to access, the right to portability. So the GDPR is rights-based, whereas the EU AI proposal is very much a risk-based uh, regulation proposal. So although they are in scope quite broad, they are quite different. So what I would like to propose is that we think about this intersection of emotion AI, how we interact with our environment, and this particular regulatory proposal, the EU one, through the perspective also of rights not just of risk. I will leave it to that. Thank you very much, Irina. Miguel, the word to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Jennifer, for for that. Uh, that was the, it was actually really, really interesting to put this in, in terms of the consent. Uh, my comments are I'm going to be very short because I'm not an expert on this stuff. I work on risk. Uh, the stuff I work on is global systemic risk. What I don't know about social media, the, the SCAD person in my department will assure you that I'm not I'm something of a Luddite. So I, you know, I, I'm coming at this from a very different perspective, let's say from Irina looking at social media, et cetera, or Jennifer, the, the, the law. Um, my, I, for the last five or six years, I've sort of taken on this role of Cassandra. Uh, I go around saying, be careful, be careful. And uh, that might not be very useful, but it's 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 not a bad idea to be a little bit uh, more careful. Uh, and let me let me tell you what I mean by that. And again, this follows a little bit what Adina was saying about risk. Um, now, as a child of a certain generation, uh, my my attitudes toward AI were probably shaped by 2001: Space Odyssey and HAL. Uh, I, I mean, I cried for Hal when he starts singing Daisy, but, you know, Hal was very scary. Uh, the idea of a machine that can read our innermost thoughts by looking at, I mean, we, we, we have the ultimate existential privacy of our own brain, yet we know that our, what we're, what's going on inside our brain has all sorts of effects on, on, on our on our faces, on our temperature, our heartbeats, etc. The the idea that machine can actually read that and start saying, you know, well, Miguel's a little bit upset today, so let's let's put some calming music on or whatever it might be. Uh, that scares the living daylights uh, uh, out of me. Now, uh, think about what this means for an authoritarian regime. Uh, 
the famous scene in 1989 where Ceausescu is giving his last speech and all of a sudden someone starts whistling and everybody turns against him. That kind of end of authoritarianism would be impossible if an authoritarian regime or an authoritarian firm can actually read how you're responding to a speech. Uh, there's a famous story that when Stalin used to speak, uh, the ovations would last half hour because nobody wanted to be the first person to stop clapping. Uh, that's a very dangerous thing. Now imagine if you don't have to do that, if there is some kind of machine that can read not only your belief or your love, your devotion to the leader or to the firm, or can actually measure whether you are complying in all the right ways um, with, with whatever exchange or whatever interaction is, 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 is taking place. That, well, let's, let's understand what we're talking about. This is the end of privacy. Um, and I think that's the way we have to think about it. It's, 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 it, what does that mean? Now, uh, the problem with some of those regulatory aspects is that it's still what I call, and other people call, it's not my term, microprudential. That is, you regulate the behavior of a single individual in, 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 in some ways. For example, uh, you can limit or constrain or at least measure the degree that a tool is being used. All right. So, you know, I can I can find out whether you're in a good mood or not, but I cannot find out why you're in a good mood or not. I mean, there, there can be some kind of regulatory. Uh, the, the, the processing can only go uh, 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 so far. So that's one that we can regulate that. We can say to Amazon, look, all right, I, I chose this mystery writer and now you're suggesting another mystery writer. That's okay. But I don't want you to be measuring how I feel when I see the picture of the author um, or whatever it, it, it might be. And we can limit that. We can regulate that. Um, we, can limit, we can regulate the production and consumption of this technology. We can simply say, thou shall not. Thou shall not produce this kind of algorithms. Uh, consent, and, and Jennifer's wonderful introduction, consent is basically about this regulation. Consent is about regulating whether an individual is, 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 has agency in a relationship, okay? Consent is, I consent for you to do this. Now that's the sort of standard patterns for, for, for regulation. What I worry about is, is more emergence of behavior resulting from this stuff. So I, there is the, 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 the privacy issues, there's the autonomy issues, there's all these, these things. I'm not so worried, I, I mean, I am, I'm scared of what it means for individual freedom, et cetera. What I'm also worried about is the emergent risks as this stuff spreads. And by that, I mean, is, is, is the development of AI, of emotional AI, feeding on itself. Uh, and, and let me give you an idea. Uh, what happens if we all start realizing that we are being measured? And you get a little bit of a Heisenberg principle. <laughs> As we become more and more aware of that we're being measured, how is that going to start changing our behavior and our interactions? Uh, I mean, is that going to take hypocrisy to a whole new level of emotional death? <laughs> so it's not so much the consent issue is what happens if we all know that this is going on? We've all done this during Zoom. I'm sure over the last two years, people have become much more conscious of their facial features. Uh, we had the whole issue of what books you put behind you. All these are ways of saying, oh, I know this is happening, so therefore I'm going to put, everybody said that the power broker by uh, Robert Caro, it was on everybody's shelf. Uh, okay, uh, so it starts, so it starts, the, the knowledge that this information is being processed starts changing behavior in, 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 in really interesting ways. So it starts perhaps measuring behavior that the machines cannot read. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and again, I haven't thought throughout all this, but I, I'm just wondering what happens if, you know, you, 
there's an old uh, uh, Eastern European joke from pre-1989. Uh, uh, one uh, one uh, apparatchik asked the other apparatchik, what do you think of the regime? And the, the, the second one says, the same as you, comrade. And the first guy goes, in that case, it's my duty to arrest you. Uh, it, 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 you, you get a machine that starts consuming itself. And I think that's where we really have to worry about the regulation. Yes, consent on an individual basis. Yes, our basic human rights. But what kind of, uh, uh, I'm a fan of sci-fi, so Black Mirror-esque uh, uh, effects do you start getting where everybody is responding to the awareness of these being measured? And it's the systemic risk of such practices. Uh, we, we've seen over the last 10 years, I mean, this is what I study, uh, the increasing complexity of finance, the increasing complexity of supply chains creates emergent properties that cannot be explained precisely by the, the, the phenomenon itself or the individual itself. Let's take that to AI and let's start thinking about how the, the, you know, it's gone so well with finance. It's gone so well with supply chains, this increasing complexity. Uh, where, where does that end when we start talking about human emotions and, and, and the reading? How do we regulate the new systems that, that, that are, arise from, from this? Um, going back to uh, uh, Edina's wonderful point about, about unpredictability. Um, we don't understand this. Uh, you know, Pandora's box is is the oldest uh, metaphor, but didn't go that well. Okay, opening that box wasn't such a good idea. And you know, I, I said at the beginning that I'm sort of a Cassandra, but let's just remember Cassandra was right. Uh, and I think opening this, I, I, I'll just finish in a second. The fact that these things have taken over our lives with no regulation, they're literally changing human theology. We are, we're all learning to cup this in some ways as we walk around. We're, we're constantly addicted to this. We've done this without regulation. Now imagine these things, but being able to read you. Um, I, I think before we let Jeff Bezos, uh, 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 these wonderful human beings, uh, Elon Musk, and all these people that are so socially responsible, before we let them put this, can we just talk about it a little bit? And um, on that, I will, I will, I will finish. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Yeah, I think we would all like to talk a bit more about this. <laughs> now we we have we extend a bit the discussion um, to have a bit more of a conversation, right? And I I saw you, Jennifer, taking notes while Irina and Miguel were were talking and I mean I saw both you Miguel and Irina nodding when Jennifer was talking so I'm I'm really just curious now for a first round um, Jennifer given your introduction and then also your perspective <clears throat> from the US and what you raised um, but now having heard what Irina and Miguel reflected on or contributed to this conversation um, is there something you would like to add on well, very briefly, because one of the, I think, best things about this conference uh, is this whole topic is so cultural. We have so many odd ideas in the United States about our independence and our inability to be persuaded by others. Um, one of the things I do is uh, work with physicians quite often and talk to them about pharmaceutical advertising. I, uh, you know, and they're all, they will tell you, well, no one can come in with a hot cup of coffee and change, you know, what medicine I prescribe. And the data is completely different to that. You can trace the path of a pharmaceutical rep through a medical office building just by tracing changes in prescribing patterns. And, uh, and you know, what I say to them is, well, then, you know, then, then you know, Procter & Gamble is a bunch of fools because uh, there'd only be one toothpaste if advertising didn't work. Um, so, but, you know, we all sort of have ideas about how we can be persuaded and not. And I, I just would say really two things. One is, I mean, what Arena says is so important. What is this right that, um, you know, what, what, how can we really protect against risks if we don't know what we have a right to be protected against? And I think that is just the most compelling framework for this whole 
uh, area that, uh, you know, is going to take a lot of thoughts and um, trying to to identify that. I mean, I would just point out one, I didn't want to talk about the EU because obviously, you know, that's not where I'm, my expertise in, but the one sentence in this proposal that is, you know, just kept le leaping out at me is one of the, uh, one of the things is uh, that you don't, uh, EU values and fundamental rights um, are threatened by uh, technologies that deploy subliminal techniques in order to materially distort a person's behavior. So what could that possibly mean? Do you have a right not to have your behavior distorted? Um, so I think there's a, a lot to that. And, you know, I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't agree more with, with Miguel that um, we, are, we have rushed headlong into the risks here and we don't know what they are. And, and you know, the question is, are we in so deep we can't get out? So there we are. <laughs> Thank you, Irina, please. I don't know because it wasn't a raise your hand function. So I just literally manually raised it. Um, uh, Jennifer, thank you very much for that last uh, point that you mentioned, which is, yeah, you're absolutely right, but that shouldn't be based on a risk-based approach to how we regulate uh, the use and the consequences of AI tools. That should be hopefully, in the way that we think about the fundamental, um, uh, the fundamental rights that us as those who interact with them, who create them at a lot, in a lot of instances, uh, deal with them. So it's, it's, it's very much about not necessarily the risk approach, but as you rightly identified, the the fundamental rights uh, that are associated with that. Yes, Miguel, please go ahead. And I think that's the last the last reflection to share. Oh my gosh! Uh, uh, well, I just <laughs> wanted to agree with Irina. Uh, certainly, coming from the United States, and we've seen this with COVID. I actually, and with all due respect to to the law. I think regulation in the United States is so concerned with individual rights. Uh, and we're, we're really concerned about, you know, don't, what is it, don't tread on me and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I, I, I'm wondering if we need to shift the conversation, not so much about protecting individual rights, but about really thinking about social dynamics. And not just regulate because we want to make sure everybody's autonomy or their agency or their rights are protected, but also in a sense, and I know this gets into dangerous territory, but also to protect society. Uh, regulation can't just be about let's maximize everybody's individual rights or everybody's individual freedom. It also has to be about, okay, what happens when you do 1001 iterations of this? Uh, should we regulate this? Not so much because we want to preserve individual rights as we really don't want to create a social order that that might be very harmful. Now, again, that gets into all sorts of very different philosophical issues, et cetera. But I think we should, we should move perhaps away uh, 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 from the individual concerns, whether it's protecting your rights or protecting you from harm, and more about what the social dynamics that will be created by this. Sorry, if I may intervene, just to clarify. So the EU AI Act, the one that I was referring about, is very much a risk-based approach. There are some people that are actually asking for a, a rights-based approach to it. And what I was trying to say is that in between we can we can work something together um it's 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 a really it's it's and then for for law it's really difficult to kind of make the balance between the two um and that's what we also see so very often so thank you miguel for uh, and also jennifer for your uh, uh qualifications when it comes to this they are so very meaningful but that's exactly it how do we actually bridge this, these very difficult, sometimes really clashing 
um, uh, ideas when it comes to how we implement laws around something that is as moving as AI. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Irina. And I'm really sorry to um, have to now close the session because we are running out of time. But I mean, as, as you see, um, there is a lot of um, yeah, remarks in the chat on how important this discussion is, right? And, and how, um, yeah, so, so very um, interesting your contributions were and how, how, how much we really need to keep an eye on that and need to keep this conversation going. So really thank you um, so much for that. And I, of course, really want to thank you, Jennifer, Miguel and Irina for joining the session today. Um, and yeah, as I said in the beginning of the session, um, we are now at the very end of this workshop um, because we canceled the last session. Um, but we hope um, this is now really only the start of many more conversations and collaborations around this topic. And we hope you enjoyed being a part of this workshop. And I would like to thank you and everyone for participating on behalf of Victor who is now not with us because he um, he lost his voice as he also now shared in in the chat.